Then, at speed, we set off downhill into the green basin of the Bekar Valley. From above, it seemed as beautiful and bucolic as the Valley of Kashmir. Rivers, water meadows, green fields, long lines of poplars and beach avenues all turning yellow in the early autumn cold. It looked a picture of pastoral innocence. Nothing about the Bekar indicated it to be the seedbed of one of the world's largest opium harvests and home to some of the Middle East's most formidable drug barons. As we twisted down the mountain slope, the impression of the gentle pastoral oasis quickly disappeared. Rubbish, cartons, old tires, cans, bin liners lay like a carpet across the ground as if there'd been no refuse collection for 20 years. Disused carrier bags caught in the barbed wire and furred the hedgerows with white polythene. Wrecked buildings dotted the roadside, neither repaired nor demolished since the end of the war three years earlier. The power lines had everywhere been hijacked by pirate operators and from every pylon a cat's cradle of wires tangled its way through a hundred illegal connections to private houses. To all intents and purposes, there was no longer any Lebanese state and everything, for better or worse, was left to the initiative of the individual. One aspect of this was the role still played in Lebanon by the Syrians. Although we'd left Syria 10 miles behind us, Syrian troops in clumsy, ill-fitting khaki uniforms, very different from the chic designer camouflage of the Lebanese army, still manned checkpoints at intervals along the road. Syrian secret police were cover up in Range Rovers, their windows blacked out with freezes of Assad posters, stood parked at pillboxes, painted the colours of the Syrian flag. <laughs> 